Good afternoon, everybody. How are we doing? I bet you're wondering what I have. I'm Jim Duffy. I'm with Code Magazine. Any subscribers? Code Magazine subscribers? Here we go. Nice, nice. Uh, our March-April issue, for those who've seen it, um, I, we put four .NET rock stars on that cover. We put Scott Guthrie, we put Scott Hanselman, we put Anders Hausberg, and we put Mr. Scott Hunter on that cover. And they were really good sports about it. And we asked them to sign. No, I'm not showing it to them yet. You gotta wait for the reveal. Come on. We asked them to sign an autograph, full-size poster of that cover. Now, the good news about this is we had them sign enough so that all four of them each get one to hang in their office because they feel special like they're on the animated couch. The best part is we had them sign an extra one, which we're going to give away to one of you. It's at codemag.com slash poster contest. Fill out an entry form, and you may walk away with a fully autographed by the four .NET rock stars Code Magazine poster. That's all I got. Good luck, hope you win. <laughs> Gentlemen, the stage is yours. All right, okay, cool. Uh, what does this button do? All right, <clears throat> cool. You good? You feel good? All right. Um, boop, boop. Oh, that's us. There you go. Hey, cool. Oh, you got the clicker? I got the clicker. All right, cool. Um, so, Scott Hunter, I'm the Director of Programming Management at Microsoft on the .NET platform. Uh, I'm Scott Hanselman, and I make up my title each time. I guess I'm a director today. <laughs> and so we got lots of content and not enough time, so we're going to go through some of this stuff pretty quickly, I think. Right. As always, we try to make sure we don't waste your time, and we know that you don't want to see just one demo. You want as many demos as possible and as few slides as possible. So we've brought you one, two, three, four, five computers all running daily bits of a magical thing. We have at things. least 10 demos. At least 10 demos. So lower your expectations? Yes. Um, there is a Channel 9 uh, session after this. And so if you have any questions from this session, please uh, tweet to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be online later after this to answer any questions you have from the session. Um, this is just kind of our, our big thing, is uh, .NET can run anything. Desktop, web, cloud, mobile, um, gaming, IoT. We're going to introduce some AI stuff in this talk today. Mm -hmm. um, this means that everyone in the audience can do all of those things. You can build anything with .NET. And this is really important, and this is a part of the big message, and one of the reasons that I've been at Microsoft so long, and why I came here in the first place, is that I'm a C-sharp developer. I really enjoy C-sharp. Maybe you're an F-sharp developer or a VB developer. And I started out in WinForms. And in the last 10 years, without me doing anything, I became a web developer, I became an IoT developer, I'm doing things on Raspberry Pis, I'm doing things on Android and iPhone and Apple Watches, and I'm still using the same language that I like to use. And it works great on all those platforms. And it works amazing, doesn't it? Thank you. Um, people always ask us, you know, is, is .NET still growing? Is it slowing down or whatnot? And you know, we're happy to announce that in the last year, we've added a million .NET developers between .NET Framework and .NET Core. So we're doing quite well. And this uh, is important to point out that these are what are called active developers. This isn't like we went and looked at the download numbers, and the download numbers are big, so we're here to show you a graph that looks like that and say, yeah, these are actually people who are actively multiple times a day, multiple times in a week doing stuff with them. Loading Visual Studio for more than one minute. They have to load it for, use it for a couple minutes, multiple times a month to actually be counted as an Before active Before they count as active. So a million people that are actually using the product, not doing a hello world and closing. Right. And, and so there walking. could be like a billion inactive .NET developers that have just loaded Visual Studio a year ago, and it's just been staying there. So I, I like to think about them as well. Um, this is always a phone for us. We never knew when we open sourced uh, .NET whether it was going to have that massive adoption where the community actually really gets behind it. But uh, you can see the, the community contributions to .NET have just exploded uh, since we first open sourced .NET. And we're really, really super happy about this. Uh, one, of the, one of the cool ones, um, Samsung. Uh, they're the ones that's responsible for the ARM32 port initially, mm -hmm. which now is how we run uh, .NET Core on Raspberry Pis. Yep. Um, and so that's a, that's a huge open source uh, contribution we've gotten. Uh, Ilrid Games has done a lot of the, uh, uh, Ben Adams has done a lot of the performance improvements that you see in ASP.NET Core. Um, and so those are huge uh, things we won from open source. Um, we want to talk about this, uh, .NET Conf. This is our virtual .NET conference. We've announcing the dates for the first time today on this, September 12th to 14th, uh, later this year. We'll have multiple days of Microsoft people, community people, all talking about .NET. 
uh, and all the new stuff we're going to show today. Um, this is great. Uh, we started uh, announcing .NET Core 2.1 RC uh, a couple months ago, and I'm happy that this morning at 8.30 we announced, uh, we released the, the bits for, for download, so you can actually grab these bits today. Uh, we'll do a couple demos on these, um, and we're hoping that we're going to have an RTM probably around the end of the month. So this is really close to, uh, to being RTM. And there's a lot of improvements we're going to talk about, particularly yeah. around speed. Yeah, the, the big thing is the um, faster build and runtime performance. If you were using .NET Core inside of Visual Studio, it was super fast all the time. Uh, but if you were trying to build applications uh, from the CLI, uh, the build performance was not nearly as good. Um, and with the 2.1, by the time we actually RTM 2.1, we basically have this back to the same point it is in VS. So you get the same performance from, from the CLI as you get from VS. Uh, another big thing for us is we want to continue closing those gaps between ASP.NET uh, System Web and Entity Framework 6. So there's a bunch of stuff we've done here to, to keep bringing stuff on. Um, once again, improve compatibility with .NET Framework. We want to make it easier for people to port your applications. So the .NET Compatibility Pack is a NuGet package that brings things like um, directory services, imaging uh, to .NET. Um, we're all probably aware of the GDPR stuff that's going on with the EU. We've got full support for that in ASP.NET Core. Um, there's some cool work we're doing in microservices. Um, I'm going to show one of the templates a little bit later on uh, as part of this. Download 2.1 RC, give us feedback so we can RTM this thing as soon as possible. A GDPR thing, man. I'm pressing OK all day. Yes. I'm Every actually thinking about harvesting. Like I'm going to make Bitcoin mining based on people clicking OK on GDPR dialogues. There's going to be a, a, a browser extension at some point that just automatically, automatically pushes GDPR OK for you. For you. Uh, this is showing the uh, incremental build time performance that we've had uh, with 2.1. And you can see with 2.0, uh, this is building a large web application uh, to the 2.1 preview to 2.1 RC. You can see we're roughly into the, about the four to five second range now. And a really important thing to point out, and it's just a reminder to everyone who uses .NET Core, maybe you're getting interested in using .NET Core, the .NET Core SDK versions at a speed and the .NET Core runtime versions at a speed. And you don't need to switch over to 2.1 and to still get the tooling improvements. So you could build with 2.1, get 5x or 10x speed improvement on your builds, and then still continue to run at your runtime in 2.0. In 2.0, exactly. Uh, this is super exciting. Um, we started taking, taking part in this Tech Empower benchmark a couple of years ago, um, trying to get .NET to be up in the, in the upper tier of this. Um, and with 2.1, you're going to have another wave of improvements here. Um, um, super excited, especially about the data one. So if you look at the one on the right that says fortunes, that's a benchmark that basically looks at data access. And you're going to see that between 2.0 and 2.1, we've increased the performance of data access by roughly 123%. Um, and that's, just, that's across Postgres, MySQL, and SQL Server. So all the the big databases, we've actually got much, much improved performance. And just to be, for context, the one on your left there, plain text, is the do nothing. Right? And it's, it's really easy to do nothing. If you do nothing, you can do it infinitely. So uh, saying hello world, we can do that. You know, like if you want to do like enterprise grade containerized hello world, you know, we can do that like two million times. But like doing actual stuff, we are seeing 100% improvements and greater in doing real stuff, so upwards of a quarter million requests a second. Yeah, and in Tech Empower, at least running it internally, we were in the top five yep. in data, data access now. Across all stacks in the entire benchmark suite. This is just a quick slide kind of showing you the big stuff that's in 2.1. Global Tools is one of my favorite where you can actually install .NET applications right from the NuGet, uh, uh, from the .NET CLI, yep. .NET install. Um, Span of T is one of the ways we actually save memory. Uh, we've got a brand new socket layer uh, that is part of the reason you see that performance improvements. We actually rewrote the sockets, used the bottom of, of .NET Core to make ASP.NET Core faster. At the same time, HTTP client, you know, just, just receiving uh, calls is great. You need to be able to send calls as well. It's 10 times faster. Uh, Windows compatibility pack we talked about before. It's that NuGet package that brings a lot of uh, the libraries you might have been used to in, in uh, .NET Framework. One little throw, you, you put span of T in there as kind of a, throw, a throwaway comment. If for those of you who are into, interested in like internal geekery of like how .NET and the CLR works, span of T 
go and, and Google with Bing for span of T, and it's a bigger deal than any of you possibly know. Like there's gonna be some fundamental groundbreaking changes and you're never really gonna know. It's like it's taking a, a, an engine, swapping it out with a hybrid and then swapping it out with an electric motor, you're still driving a car. But we're basically turning like a Honda Accord into a Tesla with span of T. So it's, it's gonna just make everyone's life better for low-level people, they'll get to experience it. For high-level people, things are just going to continue to improve. It's great. Yeah, we actually don't copy memory as much. What we're doing is we're reusing memory versus making a duplicate memory all the time. Yeah, it's really lovely. Does. Um, lazy loading is a huge feature that the EF people have been asking for. That's an EF core. Um, we have HBS on by default in ASP.NET Core. Um, big ask we've had in ASP.NET world for forever is being able to compile a UI into a library. We've got that with Razor UI. Um, and HP Client Factory is a big one that we're going to show a demo of it in a second, yep. which is how you can set your retry logic and retry rules um, globally versus having it all, th all throughout your code. And we finally got ASP.NET Core SignalR uh, running as well. We'll do a demo of that. Demos, 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 demos. Okay. This is pretty cool. We announced this this morning, I think, or maybe we're the first to announce this today. Did we announce this? Um, yeah. We have uh, SignalR service is now a, a service in Azure. So if you're running a big SignalR app, uh, you, you, we used to have these things where you could get a different backplane, your SQL-based, or use some eventing stuff inside of Azure. Now we've got this as a service. You can basically set up SignalR and, yeah, I need 1,000 connections. I need 5,000 connections. I need 10,000 connections. I need 100,000 connections. All scale in the cloud of Azure. Uh, we're going to show that. Just a yep. clicks. I, I actually had a side hustle, uh, an app that I built with Xamarin with my buddy Greg, and we, we went and manually put in SignalR hubs in multiple locations, and we did a whole thing. All of that is now SignalR as a service in Azure, just to make that scale with a slider bar. Refactoring via subtraction. One more quick thing on features. Um, .NET Core is now supported on ARM32. Um, and we have it supported not on just ARM32 for, like, um, we, we now have the SDK running on ARM32 as well. So you can actually right. install the .NET Core SDK on a Raspberry Pi if you wanted to. One of the big complaints was that you had to compile for a Raspberry Pi on a Windows machine and then push it out to the Raspberry Pi. And you had the runtime over there. Now with the, the work of Peter Marku in the community, we've got uh, SDK, .NET New, .NET Build. It's slow. It's a Raspberry Pi. But it's still awesome. Um, Azure, Azure IoT, the announcements this morning, mm -hmm. um, they're running on .NET Core for some of their work. Um, and pretty cool as well, Samsung, as I said, who actually ported uh, .NET Core to ARM32. Um, all the TVs rolling out in 2018 have .NET Core running inside of them. In fact, the dashboard you see when you boot your TV up right. is actually uh, Xamarin Forms running on a Samsung TV on .NET Core. So definitely and absolutely do not go to Best Buy and vandalize any of their things by putting a .NET sticker on t random televisions. <laughs> Do not, do not do that in any way because the stickers will not come off. And don't ask me why I know that. Okay, so let's switch to um, number seven, Scott. Yes, sir. So what I've got here is I've got a SignalR app, and I just wanted to show really quickly, we just introduced this, this uh, Azure service today. So if I have a SignalR app, all I've got to do is call this new method, add Azure SignalR, and then down here, I can say use Azure SignalR, and I'm done. Now this application, instead of running its hub locally, we'll run it in the cloud. Um, we'll quickly just kind of show what the code looks like here. Just for people that don't know, SignalR is a service that lets you send messages and receive messages to thousands of clients. Uh, you're going to see here, we're going to run a trivia app. And uh, th there's a method here called push question. And you can see that it grabs a question, and then it sends that question to everybody that's connected to, this, to the service. Um, and that's how SignalR works. Um, it's basically you let everybody can connect, and then you can send stuff to a ton of folks. So let's try this out. Um, so you're going to run the admin here. What he's going to do is run the administrative console for this, this, these questions. And SignalR, of course, using WebSockets and using all of the magic of modern, um, modern browsers. So let me, let me launch the time. admin first, okay. and we'll get, the, get not yet. I know. I want to see if it works. Because we've never tested this in front of a thousand people before. So I'm going to load the admin console up first. OK. Trivia R. Trivia R. Tri trivia R. Or. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the Azure portal. OK. And I have an app service here called Real Time Trivia. OK. Let's boot this up. Cool. And here is the URL. Zoom. And we'll zoom in here for you guys. OK. Go and hit this now. 
This is going to be either a load test or we'll just see uh, what errors look like in .NET Core. <clears throat> It'll probably hiccup. There will be errors if a thousand people show up. Like load testing usually ramps up. We should do it like the wave. We should have people go like this and then they all hit. You're going to laugh. Low. Hanselman asked me this morning, we've load tested this, right? And I said, yeah, with about four people. 15, 20, 22, 26, 25. Yes, yeah, so you can see in real time as people hit the URL, um, you can see the count. Going the website the is on, the website is on Azure, but the SignalR hub runs as part of SignalR as a service. And where's your scale? How did you scale that, sir? So what I did is over in Azure, I went to. Let's go out of the website here. SignalR hub. And we'll go to our SignalR service in Azure. Okay. It's right here. And what I did before we actually started this uh, 150 talk was I, we have these units, and this is a unit of a, of a thousand connections. It's going to cost you $20. And I took, went over here and dragged the slider all the way to 10. And so we, so we 10, support 10,000 concurrent, 10, concurrent connections is what this should support. Okay. Should cool. support. Looks like we have 170 plus people inside of here. Well, people are tired, they don't want to pick their phones up. I'll go to the admin console. And what I can do here is I'm going to start the game. Cool. All right. I'm on, I'm on the game now. And now what I can do is I can take .NET trivia and push it to folks. Let's do it, baby. Ooh, I got a question. What color is the .NET bot's belt? And the wrongs are, are, are firing up at a rapid rate here. <laughs> Incorrect. Incorrect. I put that uh, he wears a belt at night, but not in the daytime. Um, this is pretty cool. We have almost 300 players now. It's a kind of a lame question, though. Do a really good question. Okay. How many contributions one. outside of oh, Microsoft all... have been made to the .NET Foundation open source project? There's almost like 500 Thor. people on now. Okay. So the next question was just fired to everybody. Correct. Man, the wrong is really weird. these things. Real time, y'all. Real time. Now, it's important to point out also kind of how interesting this, just to prove that this is happening in Azure, you notice that he's running the admin on this local host, but his local host is talking to the SignalR as a service. This way, you all can't sneak into the admin because it doesn't exist in the cloud. Look at this. We're up to 800. 800. Let's push the final question here. Final question. That is a horrible question. ECMA, what is, what is that? Is that C sharp? I'm thinking, okay. Ooh, you failed. C, what was it? You could thank Beth Math. She's the, she's the question person here. I pushed I, it, it, when the button. When I got it wrong, it said, dang. That's adorable. That's not bad. Uh, this sample is something that we will actually make available for people to try out uh, later today. Isn't that great? Big hand for Brady Gaster for writing yeah. that for us. And, uh, and big, big hand for Azure for working on the first try. We literally, our original load test was 20. And it was basically like us, like nine people on two machines pushing F5 really hard. And so I'm glad that that worked. So the next one is something that um, I want to show is, you know, we're, we're an API-centric world now. I mean, we all have mobile devices. We might have applications that use JavaScript on the client to talk, talk to the back end. Um, and so, but Visual Studio has been primarily focused on building things with UI. And so it's, it's designed to debug things with UI. So I've got a ASP.NET Core web API here. And you're going to notice it's kind of complicated. It's got a controller folder. It's got a dub dub roof folder. It's got a bunch of stuff here. No pressure if you feel any. And uh, for I'm going to run it. Well, there's nothing to show there. Still, zooming is nice. And so you'll see that it, the, the debugging experience in Visual Studio for APIs is amazing. You get a 404 error. Well, because it's not a web page, it's an API. There is no home page. Um, it would be nice to have a better experience, certainly. So we've been experimenting with how we can fix this. And so there's, there's a couple things that I want to show here. Um, first off, this is a, a prototype of a microservice template that would come in uh, ASP.NET Core 2.2. And you're going to notice that um, all I've got is a controller. I okay. have no controller folder. Um, I've just got a program CS. It kind of boots the app up. Uh, and micro so the, service. Um, and I, we'll talk about more things that are here. This is a microservice. Nice. Um, so let's try this, that same problem again. And you're going to look here in my app. I've got a uh, add, couple of yeah. ads and stuff like that. So if you're going to add two numbers together, you need the power of Azure 
to make that. So I'm going to go and, and instead of running in a browser, I'm going to select that I want to run the HTTP CLI. I want to make sure that you hit that hard, sir. You see where it says IS Express there? Web browser is not going to be uh, Internet Explorer, the greatest browser. It's not going to be Edge, second greatest browser. It's not going to be the other browser. It's going to be a new browser called HTTP CLI. This is an experiment. We're brainstorming here. And so the idea is now I'm going to control F5, this API, the same way we did that, that API okay. before. Check this out, y'all. But now. It. Zoom in, sir. Zoom in. Now I get this console here. And from this console, I can do things like, let's do an LS. And notice it went Hang down. On. Wait, wait. Pause for effect. <laughs> you got to you got it's, it's, it's like Web API Church, sir. What did you do? I pushed, I pushed LS into a, into a web API. But this is pretty cool. What we've done is we automatically instrumented your API so it can actually return some diagnostic information to a console. Can and you do more, sir? Yes, we can. So let's go here and let's try to call that method, one slash two. And you're going to notice that... Um, you did it wrong because it says 404. You got to say Actually, add slash one slash two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you'll notice that I can basically call uh, methods right from uh, the CLI. I get my result back of three. Mm. Let's say I come over here and I want to change it. I could change this to say multiply, change the route, and I'll change the code cool. like that. I'll just save it. And I won't talk to you about the overflow issues with multiplying two ints together. That's fine. It's cool. You're a manager. And uh, I'm just going to type ls again. And you're going to notice that it picked up that change automatically. Mm. And now I can do things like multiply slash 5 slash 5. Maybe multiply like 2 billion times 2 billion. And you'll see I get a 25 back. So that's kind of cool. Now, maybe some people in the room don't like CLI. Maybe you want UI. So I'll just type UI. No, no. Yes. Yes. Did you hear that? So what, what people, we've done... Pe people were like, where's the, where's the visual in Visual Studio? I didn't ask for CLI Studio. I'm paying for Visual Studio. <laughs> Sick of Microsoft and all the CLIs, bringing DOS back. So here you go. You get the same experience in, in uh, UI. So we've made your microservice have Swagger by default, Swagger UI by default. And this is a prototype. It's a prototype. Do you want this? There you go. Now I can you get a prototype CLI for the HTTP that you can use to explore your web APIs. And you get a prototype. Okay, sorry. And I'm very one, excited about one, this. One, one final thing, um, just, to, just, to, just to close this out. Um, you get that same experience where you can actually put breakpoints in your UIs, and I can call, and, and my, my breakpoint will actually fire in my API as well. Mm. Um, so super cool. I'm here to add value. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so why don't, you, why don't you show us HP clients? Oh, okay. Is that on this machine? That's on this machine. Okay. Do I have to use the little nubbin thing that you have here? He's got, he's got the, the trackpad with the little eraser. I don't want to use the little eraser. All right. This is my, um, my, my podcast. This is an opportunity. The reason that I get to work here is I can use this as an opportunity to advertise my podcast. This is my show, and it's called Hansel Minutes because I'm a notoriously bad estimator. Uh, apparently, at some point, uh, I said they would take about 30 minutes, and I did not take 30 minutes. And they said, is that Hansel Minutes or real minutes? Uh, but this is, in fact, a 30-minute long show, and it's really great. And this has uh, been going on for 600 episodes, uh, and I have crushing imposter syndrome. So the first 500 episodes were trash. But the last 100, I really feel that the show has been um, hitting itself nicely. Now, this is all running in ASP.NET Core 2.1. I've actually been following the regular builds. I was on Preview 1, Preview 2, Preview 3. And, uh, but it had no tests. And you're on Razor Pages, too. Oh, yeah. I'm on Razor Pages as well. It's lovely. 
uh, I have no tests, uh, and it's kind, of, it's kind of complicated. And I've got all kinds of logic in here for uh, dealing with the fact that my older system was on a thing called Web Matrix using ASP.NET Pages. So this is a 12-year-old podcast with 12-year-old code that I ported directly from Web Matrix over into ASP.NET Core using Rager Pages, and it only took me about a weekend. I was going to say, how long did that port take? It took about four hours of, of, of typing and then about four hours of Stack Overflowing. And I, by the way, I was, I was nice. I ported this app to uh, ASP.NET Core 2.1 RC for Scott this morning. So, oh. <clears throat> Yeah, that was good. So he's now on RC. So uh, there's, there's two different kinds of tests that I might want to do. There's basic unit testing. And because I can use Razor Pages, I can literally just make a page model and call on get. Now, in this case, I'm not using HTTP. I'm not testing HTTP. I'm doing a, a unit test where the, where the unit is, hey, can the get work? And I'm wondering. Is this going to go and work, right? If I say nothing to on get, is it going to come back? Is it going to show 16 shows? Is the most recent show 620? That's convenient, but it's not real. There's no HTTP there. I wanted more functional tests. So here, we've got this cool new feature. We've got web application factory and server factory. So I'm saying, hey, there's a server factory derived from web application factory. And I point it to my startup. So I'm basically spinning up my application without actually spinning up my application. Because there's layers, right? There's unit testing, there's functional testing, there's full end-to-end -end integration testing. This is an integration testing where I fire up a web browser and I talk to it with Selenium or a Visual Studio test. This is above unit testing but below full end-to-end -end, uh, integration testing. So I'm going to say, hey, we're going to use localhost. I'm going to use an environment, except we're not going to use HTTP and do any, we're never going to hit the wire. It's all in memory. <clears throat> Let's go here, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to make a test fixture that's cool. And then I'm going to ask for a client and a server. OK? And then I can ask questions like, hey, client, get this asynchronously and pass in a slash. And then I can say, did this give me back an OK? So that's like a basic, basic test. But here's an even cooler one where I can say, go and get a show. And then I can say, give me an HTTP client that meets these needs, because each test has different needs. If I go and hit localhost and say, I want show 624, you know, I don't necessarily want auto redirect. So I can go and check on that. So I'm going to go and hit this here, which is 624. And I'm going to assert, did I get a move permanently? If I said auto redirect equals true, it wouldn't have given me that redirect, and I couldn't actually test my redirect mechanism. This is actually testing in memory all that cool middleware code that I put in my startup.cs. Uh, uh, now, I'm using Visual Studio Code, and I always like to see how far I can take Visual Studio Code uh, you know, without paying for anything. Um, and I've added this .NET Core Test Explorer from the community that adds things like run test. So I'm going to go and run that test, and you can see that that test failed. Uh, because I am a manager and not an actual programmer. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and hit this, and I'm going to say over here, run. I can run individual tests with this great little tool. So this is going to go and run all my tests in the standard way. I'm using XUnit. Blah, 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 test execution. I've also plugged in a couple of other things that are cool. And this is all just putting together open source stuff to make this experience great. I've got the .NET Test uh, Explorer. Wow, I am a lousy programmer. Well, I'm not going to figure out why that's broken, because that's just dumb. Um, yeah, that just makes me sad, because now I don't know why my test broke. But what I can do is I can go and see what my test coverage looks like. This is a great thing uh, called Coverlet. So when I ran that test, it went and created uh, line number stuff uh, that is in the LCOV format. And I can go and see what parts of my application got exercised and what parts didn't. So the unit testing, integration testing, functional testing story is just so nice in ASP.NET Core 2.1. If you take those things, uh, you can build a whole suite of tests and then expand by pulling in you know, this open source project like .NET Core Explorer or Coverlet or another thing like OpenCover, et cetera, et cetera. And you get a great experience. Everything's coming together very nicely, except for this test, which I'm going to be obsessed with knowing why that is failing. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and just, what? Oh, you freaking people. <clears throat> I just want to point out that there's a 1,000 people in the room here, and no one felt the need until I was twisting in the wind uh, that. Uh, but I'm not bitter. That's fine. 
you know. Nothing's if, more dangerous than being in a room full of developers. Well, it's pair programming, but it's mob, mob programming. Mob programming. Mob yeah. programming. Right, with a, with a wholly and completely unhelpful mob, which is fine. <laughs> so thank you for that. Ah, there you go. Now the other ones are question marks. Cool. Yay. <laughs> so unit testing is a joy right now. All right, there we go. You good? You got to push the button twice. You got to go like this, and you got to go like that. Here you go. Okay. So this morning, there were some blog posts that went out before we were on stage. What? I know, it's crazy. Um, we announced uh, the .NET Core 3 roadmap, because you know, we were just shipping a .NET Core 2.1 RC. Uh, it's kind of a funny thing is, when we started doing .NET Core, I thought we'd only do a version a year. I mean, a version every three years. Yes, our goal is to do a version, a brand new major version every week. Um, and <laughs> we're heading that direction, it seems like. So um, we seem to be on a major version every year, but we, we've been adding so much stuff and such big stuff, it feels like that. And so uh, the big thing is, if you look at .NET Core 2, Primarily web and cloud are, were, the, were the two workloads we were really trying to drive. Um, you're going to see with .NET Core 3, we bring in desktop. We bring Buckle in up, IoT. People. We bring in AI. Who in here uses WinForms or WPF? Come on, old heads. <laughs> Where are my old heads at? WinForms. Here we go. People have asked us for the last couple of years, are, are these things alive? Are they moving forward? Um, yes, they are alive and moving forward. In fact, they will run on top of .NET Core 3. Um, so they're on the Pause core platform now. Pause for effect. <laughs> what if, what if you could run .NET Core under WinForms? Just like we talked about, you've got this car. It works. It's great. You're going to swap out the engine and put another engine in it that is better, faster, stronger. But you still get the car that you know how to use. And we'll show you some of that bigger, better, stronger. Path. It's going to be amazing. Um, a couple big things here is, that, is WinForms and WPF are obviously both supported. Um, there'll be talks this week on something called XAML Islands. This lets you host any UWP inside of a WinForm or WPF app. So if there's an awesome UWP control out there you want to use, you can just do that. We'll show one later today. I want um, proof. Uh, XAML controls. We'll take the most popular UWP controls. We'll put them in the toolbox for WinForms and WPF so you can just drag them right into your applications and they'll just work. So they'll like appear as a WinForms control in the toolbox? Yes. Um, high DPI fixes for WinForms. Um, we'll get to that on the next slide, but to fix high DPI, we actually have to break the behavior of WinForms. And so you really want to have a side-by-side -side release of .NET to do that on so you don't break all the existing applications. And so .NET Core being a side-by-side -side framework will enable us to actually fix some things that we couldn't fix without changing all billion machines out there that run .NET. And we want to pause and talk about that for just a second. Side-by-side, -side, why is that important, right? The .NET framework is great, but if you have any fear of it, if your organization is afraid of it, if you are afraid of it as an app developer because you think a minor version might fix something, might break something, what if you could take your important mission critical WinForms apps, WPF apps, and make them self-contained? That's one of the value propositions for uh, .NET Core 3.0. Um, all access to all the Windows 10 APIs. We'll bring WinRT to .NET Core so you can call those APIs. A really exciting one we're going to demo is the .NET Core app bundler. This lets you take, build a WinForm application. You can decide you want to pre-compile the app. Um, then we can link out all the bits of .NET Core and, and WinForms or WPF that you're not using, and then turn that into a single, single exit. Demos, demos, demos. No We're slides. there. I don't want to see slides. Um, you might ask, why did we just not uh, do enhancements to WinForms and WPF on .NET Framework? Well, we are. Uh, so anybody out there, you should not be, .NET Framework is alive and well. Um, all the XAML Island stuff, the controls in the toolbox, uh, they're coming to .NET Framework 4.x as well. Um, but there's a reason to bring these desktop frameworks to core, and that is the side-by-side, -side, which Scott was talking about. You can have either an app local or a global version of the framework. Um, one of the cool things, I showed that open source, CoreFX, which is the BCL that sits underneath .NET Core, it actually has lots of performance changes and uh, even some, some changes of behavior of some APIs we've made to fix things. Um, we can't take those and put them into .NET Framework because we're afraid they would break too many applications. But the side-by-side -side nature of .NET Core lets the BCL there move a little faster. Mm -hmm. And the WinForm WPF apps will take advantage of that, and we'll show that. Um, and if you're a big fan of, we've been showing the CSProj project model where you can edit the CSProj in VS, hand type in there, that would come with these apps as well. So to be clear, I would have a WinForm app or a WPF app, and it would have a CSProj that's the new style. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Prove it to me, sir. No one believes you. 
seven, go. Visual Studio. So we will load up build demos. And before we even look at that, let's just uh, you're going to gloss right over that. You're just going to you're going to going to gloss over that. Show us that, but then not talk about it. So I've got two versions of the app. I've got a version of uh, what I call PySample. We go look at a folder on the disk and we break it up into a pie chart and show you how big those things are. Um, I've got a version that runs on .NET Framework and I've got a version that runs on .NET Core. Um, so let's go run the one on .NET Framework first. Zoom out of here, uh, make him the default. And uh, first thing you're going to notice when I do this is this is a WinForm application. Um, let's, this let's, has some controls, Telerik controls. Got some controls. It's got a Telerik control inside of there. And what it does, as I said, you just, you just give it a, a folder. Backslash? My Unix world? Yes, I am. Give it a folder, and you type run. And it goes and scans the code in the folder um, and shows some stuff here. So that's the control, and you click on that and do stuff. And then click on a thing. Click on one of these. It'll show you the folder name, how much size is in there. Cool. Um, that's a cool app. So let's go back over here and let's switch to the .NET Core version. And the first thing, as I said earlier, you have these SDK project styles. So this is this. This is the CS proj. Let me do this. That supports this. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. <laughs> Um, you're going to notice a couple things. There is WinForms mm. as, as a, it looks like a package here. It's marked alpha. Um, and What I've, are those? And I've, I just went and found some random Teller controls out on the disk somewhere at Microsoft and stuck it in here as well. Fully wanted, licensed and paid for. Because I want to see us. <laughs> if not, Sam will come and, and, and ask just my card. OK. Um, so loose DLL is being included as a reference. But the, the point here is this app is running on just some controls that already exist. Nobody had to port these Teller controls to .NET Core or anything like that. Cool. So let's run this app. Somehow less interesting, because I've seen the app before. Um, and we'll type in the same thing we did before. We can do something more interesting. I will. But you're going to notice this is now 200 milliseconds. Oh, wait a second. How much faster? Versus 500 milliseconds. So it's twice as fast. Ooh. Now, is, is the WinForms app just twice as fast for free? For free. We should charge. So <laughs> what happens is there is, is, is we've done a bunch of performance improvements on core effects. And one of them is file enumeration APIs. They're better. Um, and uh, because of that, you can see that it's at least twice as fast, if not more, uh, because of that change. Um, I want to show something else. You know, you could all sit in the audience and go, uh, sure, you say it's on .NET Core. They're saying that. It's all demo. It's all fake. It's all fake. Most of our demos are fake. So we put this uh, question mark in, which basically shows the assemblies that are loaded in the application. Yeah, and if you scroll by really fast, no one can see it, which also <laughs> But if you zoom in here, fakeness. notice that it's pulling .NET Core 2.1, all the libraries. So this is actually mm -hmm. really running on .NET Core 2.1. OK. Now, let's go a little crazier. That was great. Let's go crazy. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually take a .NET application and just publish it? And so what I'm going to do is right-click on this app, just like I would for a web app. Mm -hmm. I've got my publish here, and it says desktop single file. OK, cool. So what that's going to do is take that .NET Core application running WinForms. It's going to run it through our linker. Our linker is not very advanced yet. Um, it will get more advanced. Um, and it will, on my desktop, stick out a single file. OK. <clears throat> is it there? Yep. OK. That is now on this USB key. Put on the USB key there. And just to show this, it's the same app that we saw before. OK, double click. I thought I did. Hmm. Circle of patience. There it is. OK, cool. Um, but I do want to show it really is a single file. It's 66 megs, which seems a little heavy, but we, as I said, we haven't really worked on the linker tech a, a lot yet. But it still it shows the indication where we want to go, where you can take a WinForm WPF application, compile them on .NET Core, compile them to a single exe. Uh, they don't depend on anything on the machine at all. Not um, enough. And you're good to go. Not enough. So we should have somebody from the audience. New Windows board. laptops, Windows laptop, ready to go. Windows laptop. Bunch of guys sitting here playing Doom. Got a, OK, right here. <laughs> 
Come here. So we did a demo a couple of years ago where when we were first building .NET Core, Core where we uh, we go to conferences and we we put ASP.NET Core on a memory stick and run it on a random laptop put it, put in the audience. Right does, it have, um, does it have HDMI? This time we thought we'd actually do the same demo. Is that my phone? With okay. Windows Phone. I'm gonna keep that. That's plug fine. That, plug that in. That's, that's your phone? That's my phone, man. That's your phone. Okay. Plug that in for me. All right, there we go. Okay. Where does this go on this laptop? Fix your oh that, oh man, your resolution is crazy. Okay. Boom. I don't like your desktop. You gotta turn it around. You gotta turn it around? Yeah. There okay. we go. Okay, how does it, what does it do? It should just pop up and say, uh, let's see, is it? I plugged it in. All right, let me just open Oh, wait a second, the... this is eight. The people don't believe you. Is that eight? There you go. No, that's mine. That's your unattractive desktop. That's mine. What? No, yeah. That's his desktop, man. That's fine. No judging. Sure? Huh? I'm kidding, uh, I'm kidding, yeah. go, to, right. go to, what's it? So let's go down to... It's this PC, man. There you go, that one. USB drive. Run. Don't run any of those movies that I bought. They downloaded those later. Can I have uh, one? Double click on that. <laughs> there you go. What is this computer? This is, uh, we've got Windows 10, anything, daily builds or anything? You're not doing anything no, tricky? nothing special on this. Okay. Okay, so now hit like browse and go somewhere. All right, cool. So I'm going to open, uh, let's go to. Something you don't mind putting out to a million people. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, open really. This. Dev? Open my dev folder. Okay, cool. And then run. So this is running. Off. You have a lot of stuff, man. Not. Show me more. Show me more stuff. That's not interesting. Nah, that's not. Interesting. Do do better. Open that. Do up. Like There's got to be files. more interesting stuff in there. Program files is not. Bad. What's right. in there? I'll open this. Not okay, let's do in there. there Run go. that again. Run it. This is running off the. There you go. There you go. There we go. Hey. So this is a. WinForm app with a Telerik control with .NET Core on a memory stick with nothing on his box. Is that cool? Now I'm gonna pull the memory stick out. And this will probably crash because the disk is gone. So good luck with that. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Is that cool? So <clears throat> you want that too, right? Yeah. All right, cool. Okay. WinForms application. Could we take real legacy code? Not legacy code that the manager here did yesterday. And that's not to say we didn't prepare very hard for this show. I'm just saying, if someone were to theoretically make a demo on an airplane, it might look something like that demo. <laughs> but <laughs> can we switch over here? Yeah. This what if happened. we to take something special, something that's truly old? Truly old. Truly that truly sounds old. great. How old is it? Um, that's, yeah, that's. I guess we're on VGA, so forgive, forgive the. Uh, the quality, and we're not on the internet, which is also nice. Doesn't really matter. <clears throat> My son is 12. He'll be 13. Does anyone remember Baby Smash? <laughs> so half of you are like, oh, Baby Smash. My kid's in college. Uh, and other ones are like, Baby Smash? Who's passing babies? <laughs> no, this is a game for kids where I was using this 12 years ago to learn WPF. And I would go and push the buttons, and it would bring up Baby Smash uh, icons of letters and stuff like that. This is a 12-year-old app that I literally wrote uh, when my wife was pregnant with our second kid, and the first kid was on my knee. And we were watching some Lifetime movie, and I had nothing else to do, so I, I wrote this. Um, what if we could take this 12-year-old app and just add something like XAML content host and drop in like ink, a control that didn't exist fundamentally in a technology that didn't exist at the time that this was created, and then run that. Let us try. So this feature is this, this demo is showing XAML Islands, which is the What'd you say? Baby Smash. Baby Smash, right? Red Star. Double U. No, that's good, man. We don't have you. We don't have um, sound, but I can do it again. Talk. So we've got an integrated ink control inside of Baby Smash that's done with UWP. I could add anything. I could add in website content or whatever. Did not have to do anything to this application except bring it in and add this XAML host control. Now, in that case, you can see I'm doing a XAML host control, and then I brought in the ink. But like we said, in the future, some of those things might, the more popular controls might appear in the toolbox, and I can just drag them over and use them. Is that cool? 
I don't feel like you really appreciate that it's cool, but that's fine. It made Hanselman really happy that he was able to take his old app and, and put modern UWP controls in it without changing pretty much any of the source code at all. It's pretty good. And there's a WPF dialog box over the top of the whole thing. So it's real, just to make sure that y'all know we don't fake demos. It was all pre-videotaped. <laughs> all right, seven. Ignore that uh, somebody had to hand build that laptop for us. That's coming soon. Seven, take. Is that you? We're going to go to slides. Slides. Five, take. Click. <clears throat> Oops, I think I just dropped the clicker down the hole. Let's try that. Okay. Um, briefly talk about, uh, yeah, Dotnet Core 3. Um, our hope is to have a preview of this out later this year. You can see that we have actually had it running on my laptop with both, uh, we didn't show it, but I have a WPF app as well. We can run WinForms WPF on it today, so we're, we're actually further ahead than I thought we'd be. But there's some hard challenges like getting the designer to work and stuff like that, so um, hopefully we'll get a preview out later this year. Uh, there will also be a .NET Core 2.2 later this year as well, so it's not like we're gonna stop just uh, while we're waiting on this. Um, Productivity. We're, we're just going to quickly breeze through some of this stuff um, as Casey and Amanda and Kendra are all speaking. I think Amanda already spoke today on this, uh, uh, on a variety of these things. Uh, but we continue to actually try to add productivity enhancements to Visual Studio. The Visual Studio that shipped this morning, hmm? crunch, um, has a bunch of cool stuff in it. Um, things that I, I'm really excited about, I don't, we don't have it in here, it'll be in 15.8, is editor config is a cool way to put rules on your programmer saying, here's the style that you're allowed to use. And right now, it's only a Visual Studio feature, which means the compiler will compile it whether you do the styles or not. We're going to add that to the compiler. Uh, there's a bunch of cool stuff we have where you can take uh, link queries and move them to four eaches and back. Uh, we got some cool stuff we're going to show where we can now decompile code if we don't have the source code. Uh, we understand source maps and NuGet packages. Uh, so a bunch of really cool stuff in here. The test explorer is super fast now. Brand new icons that show how fast, uh, or what the, the actual progress. Demos, demos, demos. Um, this one's a cool one to me. Uh, Visual Studio for Mac 7.5 was released today. Um, last year, Scott and I were on stage, and we were talking about, hey, they're going to add support for Razor, and they're going to add support for JavaScript, and they're going to add support for TypeScript. Those are all in there. Um, we said, hey, they're going to add support for containers. Full container support for .NET Core is in there. Um, Azure Functions. Um, all, the, all, the, all the big things in Visual Studio have been migrating over to VS for Mac. And not only are they there, it's the same code. We're code sharing between the two IDEs. So these are very similar. Um, from a web, web perspective, uh, you're going to see a lot of work that's going on in Razor formatting. Uh, as you said, we added it to, to VS for Mac. Uh, but a big thing coming in 15.8 is refactoring. So for forever, as long as Scott and I have been on the web team, uh, you can never actually re, you know, refactor inside of an ASPX file or then a Razor file. That support's finally coming. Um, if you tried our Docker tools, uh, they put this weird compose project in your project. We're going to remove those now. You can just run right from, uh, right from in your regular project. Kubernetes support's coming in as well. We're going to show that. Um, and uh, publishing to app service non-containerized. So let's do a couple demos here. Is that cool? <clears throat> can I do this um, over here? Are you doing this or am I doing this? Why don't you start, and then I'll do the AKS stuff. Okay, sounds like a plan. I feel like we want. I want to go back though at some point and talk about Dotnet Core three. I don't, I don't know if they felt it in their chests. Because it's a big deal. <clears throat> okay, cool. I'm just saying, there's a lot going on, y'all. Okay, cool. So a couple of new things here. This is in uh, 15.7. 15.7. And I've got some tests for my application here. Back in the day, you would hit run all, and then you would just basically wait. And you had no real sense of what was going on. Now all of this is being uh, asynchronously communicated to you. So I'm going to go and build this application and then start running. And each one of these is happening asynchronously, and it's going to report how things are going and what's going on and what worked and what didn't, which is nice. Now within this, I can go and look at some particular code if I wanted to. And you'll notice, of course, all the good stuff like code lands, talking about whether the test failed or not. Those things all uh, are awesome. I have in, I think it's on git async. Yeah. Async. There we go. I've got some funky code here <clears throat> that I have mixed feelings about. 
uh, where we say like from route and routes, and then I don't really know how that works, so I've commented it out, and then I go into a projection. And like I say, I'm feeling a little weird about this because sometimes link is amazing and sometimes link does things and I don't really know why it's happening. So I'm gonna actually go and select this link query, query here. And I'm gonna get this helpful screwdriver comment. Helpful screwdriver is cool. If I, I'm gonna put that back in. Helpful screwdriver, bup, bup, helpful manager. Well, what did it say, who's this? There's a helpful screwdriver up on the top and there's a helpful light bulb over here. The light bulb tells me different stuff. I'm actually gonna say convert to for each. This will give me a real sense of what is going on in that link query, or perhaps that link query doesn't let me give the control that I wanna get. So I've actually flipped that into this enumerable, and then I can go and call that right there. Some people prefer link queries, some people prefer for each. It is the, the identical result happens. This is just one of literally like dozens of new and smarter uh, refactorings. And again, if you didn't see uh, Casey and Kendra's talk, you can see it on on-demand video because uh, they go through a ton of the, of the stuff that's been improved. Now, back to my tests, which were over here. Mouse, I'm, I'm your mouse, I'm not feeling your mouse, sir. This is not working for me. There we go. Uh, I've got a test here that continually does not work. And it's saying, is null or empty? And that's super annoying. I've got another test that's bugging me. Display time is correct. That one's here. This actually has a helper DLE called bus helpers. It goes and takes some information. I'm gonna debug that. So I'm actually gonna right click on that and debug. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit breakpoint right about yay and say right click debug select to test. Go and check that out. <clears throat> now bus helpers came in, it's not any source that I have. You look over here on the side, it's actually coming in as a dependency from um, elsewhere. I'm not sure where it is here. Bus info, where's bus helpers? One of these places has a NuGet called bus helpers. It's in the beast somewhere, I'm not even gonna go look for it. But here, I do not have that source. I am going to F11. Now hang on, people are like, I think he paused, we should clap. <clears throat> Again, we don't want your pity applause, so it's gotta be real or we don't want it. When you bring down a NuGet package right now, that NuGet package knows that it has these, these DLLs for you, but does it know where the source code came from? It doesn't know from whence it came. So what do we do, what do we do? I'm not even gonna click the button, I'm gonna let it hang, and I'm gonna look here at the new spec. The NuGet spec file knows where the source is and the commit for this one. Remember when we promised you this? Don't applaud yet, it's not done. <laughs> I'm gonna hit download source and continue debugging. I wanna just say something. It popped up a message that just said, the debugger is locating source files. And now, I'm gonna hover over this here and that file is available. Here's a little tip for you when you have these little transient um, uh, tabby deals. You can right click and say open containing folder. There's the file that came down and now I am F11ing into a NuGet that I got from elsewhere. Now you clap. We so, demoed this last year but it was fakery. It was um, fakery. And now it's real. Okay, so then, I wanna point this out, I went and tried to say F11 off into some other code that I didn't have uh, the code for. And that was not uh, in, um, that was something that I did not have a NuGet package for. So that can be annoying. <clears throat> Excuse me, let, me, let me stop that. I was digging, 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 where did it go? It was an assert. I'm lost, what's happening? Ah, uh, no. It's uh, the dude, test, sir. Dude, oh, I was over in the test. Go to the test, you had an assert in the test. There you go. Somehow I feel like bad when you help me. <laughs> I don't know if that's your intent. Um, if I want to debug into like assert r equal, right? What if I could right click on that and say go to definition and I get a giant scary legal thing <laughs> that says this. Legal 
legal, 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 legal. The legal thing is reducing in the next version. There be dragons, okay? Yes. <laughs> nice. Good luck, y'all. Click. <laughs> Navigating to definition. Way. Look, we just decompiled the thing that we wanted to go. I just go to definition and decompiled it. And because I've got the PDBs and stuff, uh, because I bought this DLLs else, it pulled out the uh, help as well. Can you show folks where they would turn that on? Where would you turn it on? Somewhere in quick launch, I think it's like experimental something. Hang on, don't, don't, don't make me feel bad, because you always do that. It's not there. I know it's not what I just clicked on. It's in advanced. There you go. C sharp advanced, enable navigation to decompiled sources. What could go wrong? <laughs> so the point here is that when you're doing that debug experience, you want source code. Ideally, people will start putting in their new specs that here's where the source code goes, and you'll be able to F11 into anything. Now, of course, we're showing you one where we have a public NuGet that happens to have public source code up on Git. Certainly, that could work in, a, in an environment where you have your own NuGet server and your own source code that exists in different places. So there's a lot of possibilities here. Imagine if you're working on an enterprise app, and you only have the little bit of code that you have, like we saw me in the keynote with 10 projects, and I hit F11. And then I find that another team on another NuGet server that has source published in their new spec, I could F11 into that. And then I reach some other team, and they're mean, and they won't give me my source. I right click, and I go to decompiled source. You like that? All right. Now one more. Let's add the editor config in. All right. Now, editor, editor config. I feel like editor config is like the little feature that could. It is we so didn't. powerful, and people don't get it. We didn't what? I so said we didn't put the solution items in here for you. No, I know. It's fine. Okay. That's cool. That's cool, man. Just I'm chilling. Make sure you figure it out. I think, I think it's important to show people that I can type. You know what makes fun of me? I like when I actually can. Well, you're a manager, you know. You manage your stuff. He actually has an app with a demote button. This is true. <laughs> he didn't want me to tell you this, but he was in a meeting. He was in a meeting, and Glenn was doing a demo. He fires up a little app and he hits run, and he types in Glenn's alias and the big fat button that says demote. And then he's, Glenn's doing his demo, doing demo, and then he just rotates his laptop so that Glenn could see it, and it says, Glenn, demote. He just starts pushing the button really hard, saying, do great on your demo. Is that the app right there? Yeah, it was. <laughs> like, you think I'm making this up, y'all? It's, it's marked right there, demoter. This is, help me, help me. Is this a cry for help? Uh. <laughs> All right, so what you can do in your editor config is I can go and right click here and say like add new item and I can say I need an editor config file and it's called uh, dot editor config. Now this isn't a Microsoft thing, this is a thing thing, this is an everybody thing. And this is one of those things where you know you like tabs but you live under an authoritative regime so uh, <laughs> They impose their will upon the people by checking in editor config. And editor config is understood by all different editors. And this goes and says things like style, and I want XML files to have an indent side of two, like a savage, and you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But to, to Hunter's point, the compiler didn't really care. So then you'd end up with rules in like FX cop talking about here's how I want C sharp to behave. It would be nice if the compiler understood editor config as much as the editor understands editor config. Which so, then means your CI system will actually catch people. <clears throat> so what if we did this? We really want to make people hate their lives. We will get rid of the ability to do var. <laughs> yeah, right? Again, help me. Um, so here, we're basically saying no var here. If the type is apparent, no excuses, none. Like all these reasons, and then, go like this, I put that at the solution level because I want to make it suck for everybody. <laughs> and then I'm going to go into control T, was it on get async? On get async, yes. <clears throat> uh, uh, uh. No, it's not doing what I thought it would do. I maybe put the file in the wrong folder. I don't know. It's supposed to be for everybody. On, on, did I save it? Yeah, don't even. Someone's like, did you save it? 
Probably not. <laughs> it's fine. This is fine. Do I have to compile? What do I have to do? No, it should have just worked. What did I do wrong, sir? This is where you have to help me. It is saved. It's like, I thought it was a squiggly, but it was dust. Yeah, I don't see it. Is that supposed to be true, now? That looks right. That was the stuff we put on. Yeah? I never, I don't like demo fails. I don't believe in demo fails, so I don't believe that this is a fail. Does that file go there? I'm just gonna copy it everywhere. Because <laughs> I don't, I don't even care. That'll right? Because I just want it to work. Ship it. I don't care. That'll be my next app. Editor config everywhere. Um, change it from none. What does that even mean, man? <laughs> Warning. Well, come up here and help. <laughs> oh, I see. Look at that IntelliSense, too. That's nice. Thank you for that. Close the file, reopen the file. Close the file, reopen the file. Yeah, when you whisper that, no one can hear you. Do you know that that's... <laughs> now I got what? Oh, man. Yeah, you copied it everywhere. Why are you all so mean to me? You know you can delete those other copies. No, man. <laughs> I'm about to compile. I'll get that to ship, baby. It's like a train wreck. I know the wrong place. I don't even Con know. Converting, converting your app this morning it? was the same way. Your CS project. So I've messed this all up because, hey, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and just ship that. <laughs> is that cool? All right. I, there, there is a big, big new thing in 15.7. Totally knew that that was here, what which I had is, to do. It used to be that we would show you this fixed thing, and you could fix one thing. You never want to fix all of them, would you? Is this yours? It was. Okay. Um, so now we have a fix-all. So all right. Now show potential fixes and fix it everywhere because a search and replace that works globally across your solution is always the right idea. <laughs> no. But seriously though, this is a good idea because what's nice about this is this isn't a search and replace. This isn't a control H. We've all done that. This is a Roslyn analyzer. So this is guaranteed to compile the code. It is still going to work. These are making non-destructive changes. And they also follow, when you're doing them on a file basis, uh, they, they stay into the, zoom out, sir. They stay in the uh, undo buffer. So you can control uh, Z your way back to glory. Let's see if this works. Oh, it's probably not going to work. I didn't fix the test. I'm just trying to make it pretty. Ah, it succeeded. I, I think we're. They succeeded in compiling. That thing compiles, that's good. Yeah, but the tests are still deeply, deeply wrong. Um, let's show one more uh, productivity feature here. OK. So I've got an API and a web app. And this morning, you were showing some, some Azure Kubernetes service. Love me some Kubernetes. And so we have a preview extension coming out probably next week Yep. Uh, for 15.7, um, where you can actually add Kubernetes support to any um, .NET application. So notice here I've got this container orchestration support I can click on. OK. And it says, oh, and I can pick an orchestrator. And you're picking Kubernetes and Helm. Nice. I'll do that. I'm going to do that. And on a this miracle one. happens. I'm going to do what, that. What, on this what one. just I'll, happened? I'll show you what that's going to do in a second. You're yada yada yadaing through the important part. Yada yada yada. Are you going to do it to everyone like I did? Just you those, gave me crap about just those two. I, we, we have we have a double app. So we have an app that has a oh, API. It's, it's got two parts. And we have a web. If we were going to publish this to Kubernetes, I'd want to publish both of them, not just one of them. My bad. So I added orchestration support to both of those. Okay. Um, that'll put a charts folder in with a bunch of metadata and templates and stuff that uh, Kubernetes supports. I don't want to get into that. Uh, you know that YAML stands for yet another Lynn, markup language? Lynn and Steve have a, a session going on right now, unfortunately. Yes, there is actually a Kubernetes and Docker session right now that Glenn uh, Condren and Steve Lasker are doing. So watch that in the replays. And they'll talk about how to actually, what those files are and how to use them. Yep. But after I do that, um, I now have this new feature here, published to Azure AKS. Cool. Pause for effect. Uh, it actually it takes a little bit of time. This is, that's, a, that's why this is a preview extension. Oh, OK, cool. Um, it's, it's mining Bitcoin. Oh, right and this now. is the whole, it's mining. <laughs> and uh, that's our new strategy, mine Bitcoins in the published dialogue. It's not like you're doing anything else, right? 
every refactoring. And so what means. this will let me do once it, once it finishes uh, giving us a circle of patients is I can select my subscription, uh, my AKS cluster, and my container registry. And then once I'm done with that, my project set up with one click publish to AKS. OK, so it is going to do the build and the stuff that it usually does. And then it's going to publish it. And if I understand correctly, it's going to publish it by pushing it to the container registry. Right. It and then telling, uh, and then doing a deploy or an update. It will, it will basically push each application to the container registry as a container. OK. And then it will actually then tell AKS, go pull from the container registry. It's like, hey, I know the, I know the, the container registries have both changed. Do a pull. AKS will pull those images back in, and your app will be running. How concerned should I be right now? About what? The circle of patience. <laughs> how much, somewhat, how somewhat much patience do you have? Uh, well, it depends. There's people here, and they have. If we, if we, if we went into the expensive meeting calculator, uh, <laughs> we're costing these people money. I think we have time. Okay. You're, you're, <laughs> you're mean, dude. <laughs> So something ain't right. This is experimental, I will say that. Um, and, um, and honestly, the demo would end at this point anyways, because after it's done. Well, the demo would end by these things filling up and you hitting OK. Ah, uh, I'm trying to save it and make it sound good, Scott. OK, that's cool. All right, so let's, let's all. switch back to slides for a second. Let's all pretend that you pushed OK. Oh my god, that is amazing. Fantastic. Good job. Um, five. You good? Take? Good. Um, Ooh. Oh, yeah, we have two demos left. Are we going to do this one, or is Anka going to do this one? Uh, I was not. I don't even know where he's sitting. I'll do it. Um, .NET Machine Learning. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, we're excited to talk about today. Um, if you're using .NET and you think about machine learning, we have a couple of things in Azure. We have a great pile of services called uh, Cognitive Services. And these are basically AI for people like Scott and I that don't know a lot about AI. Um, and they're really cool services. They're just REST APIs. You call them, feed them some data, and you get a result. Um, and this is what, if, if you don't know AI or you just want to use some pre-built AI, this is great tech, and I highly recommend it. Uh, but there's some, there's some issues with it. You can obviously hear I'm looking at this for sentiment. I, I might have something that looks to see what the sentiment of stuff is. And you're going to see this is going to score really red. This is a great vacuum cleaner. 96% positive. Um, this next one, this vacuum cleaner sucks so much dirt. Well, normally the word sucks is, is not a good thing. But in this case, it actually is a good thing. This is a great vacuum cleaner. It sucks a lot of dirt. But our sentiment analysis says this is not a good, not a good review of your, your vacuum cleaner. Um, and so this, is, this shows you where some of this pre-built stuff can kind of fail down, fall down some, in some cases. And so um, what we would ask somebody to do is basically build a custom model. So get some data, train a model. And you're hurting me here. <laughs> um, and so there's a bunch of, of uh, AI libraries out there for a variety of texts. Um, and you can see them up here. And we're happy to announce today that we have something new called ML.net, um, which is based on some tech we have in Microsoft. We've been using for years for Bing and for Office uh, and other products inside of Microsoft. And we thought, hey, we got this great tech. Why don't we open source it, uh, give it to you guys, and make the APIs awesome for regular .NET developers. Um, and it can actually consume and work with some of the other .NET uh, AI libraries out there, like a core.NET and CNTK. Mm -hmm. So this is the launch. We are launching, we are launching ML.NET. Right now. now we're calling it 0.1 for a reason, because I want to make sure that you're clear that this is something that has been used internally for years. It is used by can we say? Data scientist. It's, yeah, I already said Bing. Bing, all, the big, all the big stuff. And uh, what we've done is we've brought some of it out, all of it out, and it, it might be a little messy. We're going to tidy it up. So you might see some stuff that uh, is uh, internal stuff. But it's all open source, all the way down the stack, trying to make machine learning available for uh, .NET developers. Remember at the very beginning how I talked about how I started out doing WinForms. I came from Visual Basic 6 to WinForms. And then without doing anything, I became an Android developer and an iPhone developer and a Raspberry Pi developer. Now you all just became machine learning experts. So I want to make sure you add that to your resume <laughs> and your LinkedIn profile uh, immediately after this session, because I want to see thousands and thousands of machine learning experts uh, who know how to press F5. Uh, okay, so that is the let's, qualifying let's stuff. Let's switch over and let's do okay. a demo real so quick. So we'll switch over to seven. 
So we wanted, a lot of times we demo AI stuff, we demo kind of fluffy stuff that people don't, you know, never really use. Yeah, this is real. And we want to, we actually, in, in Ankit's talk tomorrow on AI, he has three cases of, of real world things that you can actually take his code and use. Right. This is one of them. He's going to go deep into this tomorrow at 2.15. Um, and so the idea here is, when you file an issue in GitHub, uh, a human today goes and says, oh, that issue is networking, or that issue is ASP.NET. Um, and we said, could we use AI to actually do this for you? So I've, I've got a, a GitHub issue I was just about to file. Okay, so something wrong with client WebSocket. I don't even know what namespace client WebSocket is in. Right. And then you're gonna go and hit submit new issue on that. And you'll notice, of course, that it's got no labels, Where? it's got no assignees. Some human who has an amazing job is gonna have to go through that manually and figure that out. Yep. But humans have been doing that for years. Right? In fact, we've taken thousands and thousands of already talked about, this is a tab separate file, these are thousands and thousands, this is a non-trivially sized file. We took years of data from our repository. Right. So when you type in, uh, this library sucks so much dirt, then we can figure out uh, that you really hate that library. And this, this, this works because we've had all these issues, I think there's 10,000 issues in here. Yeah, all these issues have been hand selected by an engineer, so we have great training data here wow. uh, on how to do this. 16,000 and change. Cool. So then, here's the part that's cool, and this is why I'm not, I'm not joking. Maybe you're not data scientists. You'll need to go and talk to your data scientist. The data scientist can go and train this, or you could train this yourself. Uh, we went ahead of time and did the training on this. It took about five, 10 minutes. And we took that file, that TSV, that tab separate value file, ran it through the model, and then turned it into a blob. And that blob is the model. You can see here it's in a folder called models. That is not a DLL, it's a blob format, but I could hand it to you, he could hand it to me, and he could say, here's the model, or here's the updated model, I've trained it, it knows more stuff. So F5 the app. So what we're gonna do is hit F5, and this is gonna go and talk to GitHub and pull out the unlabeled stuff, and I can go and F11 into that, and it's gonna say for each issue in issues, it's gonna go and get all of the GitHub issues, and then it's gonna think about those things and label those, okay? Labeling complete, go back over into GitHub and hit refresh, and nothing has happened. Is it not new enough? That I uh, you have to wait to do it within one minute. One so minute it was not new enough. One minute of what? Oh, it's not fresh enough. Oh, because so this is an interesting point. Uh, just to be in the interest of clarity. We did not we, want to scan the entire system. We didn't want to scan the entire system. Now, ordinarily, the right way to have done this is to make, go ahead and do it again. I uh, have the, yeah. So what we needed to do here, and I'm not making excuses, I want to understand that the right thing to do would be have like an Azure function or a bot that was running in the background. A GitHub webhook would call over to that using like the ASP.NET Web API webhook library and then kick it off. For the purposes of the demo, we put that into a console app that's going up and talking to that because I want you to understand that you know how to talk to the GitHub API, you know how to call a web API. Now you're just gonna call this ML. There you go, library. Scott, look, look on the screen. There you go, labeling completed. So it's looking for fresh items within the last minute. This is, for the purposes of the demo, a polling example. Hit, hit refresh and zoom in on labels in the lower right-hand corner there, sir. You're super fast with the, with the zoom it, I love it. No, I'm looking to see if, the, yeah, there it goes. So, uh, there you go. There we go, look at that. So that automatically figured out the client WebSocket is inside of system.net. So anybody that has your own GitHub and your own source, you could use the exact code we wrote here, Think, train it against your existing issues, yes. and it would work on your, your Think code. Think about all the stuff that you could do uh, uh, with uh, comments on your blog, uh, information in CRMs, like all the kind of cognitive services somehow become available to you. That, run, that ran locally. We trained it locally, we ran it locally. There's a runtime that speaks that model's blob format and did that work. And I can go and take that and put it anywhere. And uh, that is now available in ML.net. You can check it out at .net slash machine learning at GitHub. So that's pretty freaking amazing. And that's just gonna get better and better over time. So now, we have a little bit more time and this is gonna be even cooler. Yeah, give me one second to reset this. Differently cooler. Are you resetting this? Yeah. Am I hiding something from the people? Yes, you are. Okay, what am I talking about now? Blazor. Ooh, Blazor, y'all know about Blazor? Okay, so <clears throat> we've seen JavaScript 
become the virtual machine for the internet, right? And we've seen transpilation, where someone transpiles something into JavaScript, like CoffeeScript turns into JavaScript, or TypeScript turns into JavaScript. But then we've also seen asm.js, which was a point in time. It was an assembly, made, assembly language style of JavaScript. And then WebAssembly, an actual uh, assembly language binary format that is now available in all browsers, which gives you native performance. What if you could write a web UI using entirely .NET, and it would run in the browser, where .NET itself runs in the browser inside of WebAssembly. What if? Are you still fixing your demo? Yeah, go and, go and switch back to switch back switch the machine. Them? And I'll okay. let you talk to this, and then I'm going to switch back and write All some right. code. So pause for a second. Zoom in on the right-hand corner there, sir. See where it says mono.js? There are different instances of .NET. When we say .NET in the old days, it meant the .NET framework on Windows. Now it means .NET or .NET Core or Mono. .NET Core is a small runtime that runs on a half dozen or a dozen, actually more than a dozen flavors of Linux. It runs great. It is a optimized tiny .NET. Mono, however, historically has continued to be improved. Amazing work. It powers Xamarin. It's an extremely portable clean compiling version of .NET. What if we compiled that to WebAssembly? Well, they did. So now you're actually running .NET in the browser. So when he loaded this application. You do it again? Did you do it again? Is that, that's if you want to see it again. Now, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, man. Hit refresh. OK, so that just loaded .NET. Now, I think it's, what, it's like a meg or how big is it? Oh, see, look, let's see the DLLs? Scroll down, man. Scroll down, scroll down. Look. It's actually loading DLLs. The DLLs haven't been compiled to .NET. The DLLs are just DLLs that you write. Those then come down, and then the browser freaking runs them. It's .NET Standard 2.0. Remember how we talk about the importance of .NET Standard? There are multiple instances of .NET, and if you uh, talk to the standard, your stuff will run on a Raspberry Pi, it'll run on an iPhone, and it'll run, and it'll run in a browser. What if the browser doesn't support WebAssembly? It'll fall back to asm.js, which is that point in time between JavaScript and WebAssembly. But this supports all modern browsers. So what he's doing right here is he's got uh, a function called onHover. Everything in functions there is C sharp. He's writing C sharp. He's writing onHover and on not hover, And he's got this thing called text. It's just sitting there string text. <clears throat> but he needs to go and bind that page model to something that's on the page. So he might say there in the H1, uh, something like at text. You're writing Razor in the browser right here. So now he's going to put at text there and at text there. And then theoretically, you don't want to just change stuff. You want to react to events. What if there was an event he could react to, like on mouse over? Now notice how everything just turned purple. That's a, a sign that that H1 is now understood by the, the runtime. He says, on mouse over, on mouse out. And now, based on JavaScript client-side events, he is going to run, to be clear, client-side.net events. I, I call C sharp from HTML tags. From the DOM. Make it so, sir. OK. He forgot something. It's going gonna, it's gonna to fail horribly. I on did. mouse out, I man. did. I put, on mouse I put out. parents up here. There you go. Save your file. <laughs> at, dude, at. OK, you guys are killing me. It doesn't feel good. I'm glad you Does, cried from next. It doesn't feel good, does it? <laughs> <laughs> this is why I started drinking. <laughs> OK. We good? So refresh the app over here. Mm -hmm. Now, some people might say, I don't want to download a one meg runtime or whatever meg runtime of .NET. It's like, well, then you probably shouldn't have a giant PNG on the home page of your website. Look at that. Jump, jump over into fetch data for me. Which jump, one? Over, jump over. We're, we're out of time, but jump over to fetch data. Clicking on that. Now pop over and show me the fetch data controls in the, in the, in the code, man. You fetch data. The, uh... Open that up. Scroll down. That's calling HTTP, get JSON. It's using the .NET API that you know how to use. But this is web stuff. 
This is web stuff. We're not trying to do XAML. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. This is not trying to be web forms again. This is, I have expertise. I have understanding about .NET and C Sharp, but I want to use the web, and I want to do it in a standard way. This is a standard way. It's an experiment, but we think people will dig it. You like it? It's called Blazor. So just to recap, uh, .NET Core 2.1 is available today. Please grab that. ML.NET preview is available today as well. Please, please grab that and give us feedback on it. Yep. .NET Core support for desktop is announced. Preview later this year, we hope. Um, and the Blazor stuff, uh, please try it out and give us feedback on it. And um, Oh, and then uh, we need to get the, um, yeah, the, go there, hang on, go to the next one. We gotta take a picture of that. Here's where you should go check out. These are some of the sessions you wanna check out and explore. And then he's a manager, so the feedback doesn't matter to him. But there's going to be a QR code, take a picture of that, and give me amazing feedback, and give him suboptimal feedback. And then I will put that through ML.net, and I'll write about it on my blog, and we'll see what the sentiment analysis talks about, which Scott you like better. We'll see if machine learning knows how to tell Scott's apart. This Scott sucked, but the other Scott was amazing. <laughs> see how that works out. So check it out. Complete your evaluations, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.